The overall details concerning the beginning of Image Comics are easy to state. Seven artists, who primarily worked for Marvel Comics, joined together and started their own publishing company. They created and owned their intellectual properties. They invited others to join this publishing venture, extending the same creator's rights to everyone. Most became quite wealthy. Everyone was happy, until they weren't. However, the specifics are opaque. The motivations, intentions, and egos of all of those involved tell a variety of conflicting narratives. In other words, there is the legend, and then there is the truth. Somewhere in between is the actual story. Hello and welcome. The very early inspiration for Image Comics appears to begin with Rob Liefeld. At the time, Liefeld was working on X-Force, the revamped version of the New Mutants. He had taken over a low-selling title on the brink of cancellation and turned it into a top 10 comic. One could describe his art style as exaggerated and excessive. Yet, like the other artists Marvel had fostered in the late 80s, his style had a mainstream appeal. It was bold and dynamic, and it infused the superhero genre with a fresh coat of stylistic paint. Liefeld, for reasons that are unclear, planned to publish a black-and-white comic titled Executioners with Malibu Comics, an ad for which appeared in the September 9, 1991 issue of Comic Buyer's Guide. A Marvel Comics editor, Bob Harris, approached Liefeld about the surprise announcement, and he strongly suggested that if Liefeld were to publish this comic, Marvel would likely pursue legal action, since the name was a blatant ripoff of the X-Men brand. Due to this implied threat, Liefeld's planned miniseries never materialized. This plan to publish with Malibu arose out of a dinner conversation at a convention between Liefeld and the publisher of Malibu, Dave Ulbrich. In attendance at that dinner was Jim Valentino and Eric Larson. The possibility of Malibu publishing creator-owned work by these three artists was lightly discussed. According to Ulbrich, Malibu Comics was almost the original publishers of a black-and-white version of Youngblood in 1987. However, before Liefeld completed the project, he got a job at DC, penciling Hawk and Dove. The publishing agreement was subsequently cancelled, and Ulbrich and Liefeld remained on friendly terms. So, they had an ongoing relationship, and the door was always open for a Liefeld project, should he decide to publish creator-owned material. During 1991, Todd McFarlane, Liefeld, and Eric Larson all discussed the possibility of unionizing. That appears to be McFarlane's original intent, to form a union of artists. Over time, this discussion transformed into the idea of walking away from Marvel in one large group, as a show of solidarity. Again, the intent of this action was to get Marvel to seriously address their concerns. Regardless, at this point, it was all talk. Although, the idea of a group of artists leaving Marvel and making a statement clearly appealed to McFarlane. Meanwhile, McFarlane was nearing the end of his tumultuous 15-issue run on Spider-Man, the first title he wrote and illustrated. He was completely unhappy with the editorial interference he received on that title. The main editorial concerns were the dark storylines he crafted for the generally light-hearted character, his portrayal of Mary Jane as a flat, boring party girl, and the quality of his writing in general. Due to this lack of control over the title, McFarlane considered quitting. The deciding factor for McFarlane was the censorship of a graphic injury to the eye scene involving the Juggernaut. For obvious reasons, McFarlane lost that battle, and he subsequently quit the title. This incident coincided with the birth of his daughter, so he drifted away from comics and seemingly disappeared. The editor-in-chief at Marvel Comics, Tom DeFalco, would later state that McFarlane was perpetually disgruntled and looking for a reason to leave Marvel. If it wasn't over that edited scene, it would have been for something else. It really was only a matter of time before Marvel and McFarlane parted ways. Over the years at Marvel, McFarlane developed a healthy ego. One of the things that apparently bothered him was criticism of his artwork. He was of the opinion that his artwork was the feature that sold comics. Furthermore, his instincts as an artist were better than any writer or editor. Therefore, everyone should shut up, accept what he submitted, and print what they got. Another idea that appeared to greatly bother McFarlane was the notion that he was replaceable. 
Despite his popularity and marketability, at the end of the day, he felt that Marvel Comics was treating him like he was simply the most current talent they employed. At some indistinct point, someone else would come along and replace him. Following his departure from Marvel, McFarlane and Liefeld continued talking and eventually decided to recruit other artists to join them. The overall idea was to create their own titles that would be published by Malibu, and if they drained the talent pool at Marvel and threatened to create work for another company, Marvel would then have to take them seriously. It would give them a position of power to negotiate. Eric Larson was one of the first that was on board with the idea of creator-owned work, and he became a part of the ongoing conversation between McFarlane and Liefeld. Larson was a popular artist who had a style that complemented McFarlane's. During McFarlane's Amazing Spider-Man run, Larson appeared to be the regular fill-in artist when the comic book went bi-weekly, or when McFarlane was behind schedule. When McFarlane left Amazing Spider-Man, Larson took his place. He did the same thing when McFarlane left the newly launched Spider-Man title after issue number 16. Larson was a solid artist, but other than a redesign of Venom, there is nothing outstanding about his career at Marvel. He did solid work, but there was no distinct achievement. Jim Valentino also joined the conversation. Liefeld regularly consulted him for advice, since Valentino had roots in independent publishing. Valentino originally got his break doing Normal Man for Aardvark Vanaheim and then Renegade Press, so he knew the ins and outs of dealing with a small press publisher and producing an independent comic. Valentino was a hard sell to McFarlane. At the time, Valentino was writing and drawing the mid-tier title Guardians of the Galaxy. He was no one's definition of hot. However, Liefeld valued Valentino's advice, and, as he reasoned to McFarlane, the idea of a union was for all artists, not just the popular ones. And, with that logic, Valentino became part of the collective. The Foundation for Image Comics coalesced around a Sotheby's auction of comic book-related material. At Marvel's invitation, Jim Lee, Rob Liefeld, and Todd McFarlane attended the event, presumably to bring more media attention to it, since some of their artwork was up for sale. Just by chance, Mark Silvestri, who was in New York to pitch Cyberforce to Marvel, was staying at the same hotel as McFarlane. Upon running into Silvestri, McFarlane pitched the image idea to him. At the time, Silvestri was considering leaving comics altogether, having achieved everything possible within the constraints of the industry. Seeing a good opportunity, Silvestri immediately joined the growing collective. As many have stated, including all of the image founders, Jim Lee was an essential, key component to all the events that followed. Without him, image comics may have never begun. He was a complete wild card in the sense that he literally had no reason to leave Marvel. If he could be convinced to leave, it would be a shock to everyone in the industry. Jim Lee is an intelligent man. He's well-spoken, usually careful with his words, and tends not to make a move without considering it thoroughly. So, shock factor aside, if he joined McFarlane and Liefeld, that would lend weight to what they were trying to accomplish. If Jim Lee saw worth in what they were doing, then it must be worthwhile. His involvement would greatly diminish the perception that this was merely a temper tantrum thrown by a few artists who felt they deserved more than what they received. Furthermore, Lee was the hottest of the bunch in terms of sales. His artwork had a more grounded style that gave off a Neil Adams vibe, and his staging of fight scenes seemed to be more visually consistent than his peers. Those that preferred more cartoonish figures would gravitate towards McFarlane or Liefeld. Those that preferred more realistic proportions and features would generally choose Lee. Again, accounts differ, but it was either at the auction or at the dinner thereafter that both McFarlane and Liefeld pitched the image idea to Jim Lee. Lee carefully considered the consequences and the risks of leaving Marvel. He calculated the number of issues he'd have to sell on his own to maintain the income he was currently receiving from Marvel. Whatever number he reached seemed possible, and the risk seemed reasonable. Lee then agreed to join Liefeld and McFarlane. He also agreed to attend a meeting they had arranged with the publisher of Marvel Comics. Lee's involvement became the show of force necessary to move this idea forward. Here's where the timeline gets a touch hazy. The sequence of events is difficult to sort due to conflicting accounts. The one event that certainly occurred first was the fateful, legendary meeting with Marvel Comics. 
On December 17, 1991, Todd McFarlane, Jim Lee, and Rob Liefeld had a two and a half hour meeting with then Marvel Comics publisher Terry Stewart. Also in attendance was editor in chief Tom DeFalco, who walked in uninvited, and McFarlane's wife and newborn daughter. Accounts of this meeting greatly differ. Other than Todd McFarlane, most participants agree the bulk of this meeting was a negotiation for better terms. According to DeFalco, the artists spent a good amount of time airing their grievances and making demands that were clearly not coordinated beforehand. That is, they didn't have specific terms to negotiate. Furthermore, each artist had a different emphasis on what was important to them. Although, control of their own creator-owned titles was the one point where they were all in agreement. They were offered the Epic Comics line. Not only was that a floundering imprint, thus a tarnished brand, but ownership was a 50-50 split between the creators and the company. As an offer, it wasn't one any of the artists took seriously. Stewart and DeFalco suggested these three artists take the evening to talk about the terms they were seeking and then return the following day. After that, they'd negotiate and see if they could settle on a deal that satisfied all parties. McFarlane would later characterize this meeting as nothing more than an announcement and a statement of intent. There were no terms that he would find suitable in order to continue working for Marvel. This was a courtesy call. However, both Liefeld and Lee were under the impression this was a negotiation. Self-publishing was the backup plan in case Marvel was intractable. In the end, the meeting confirmed to McFarlane, Lee, and Liefeld that their concerns were not shared by management. They were replaceable, if necessary. They may be the most popular artists of the day, but that was a temporary title at best. The overall selling point for a comic book was the characters they illustrated, not the person drawing them. The following day, Lee, McFarlane, and Liefeld had a meeting at DC. In attendance were both Dick Giordano and Denny O'Neill, presumably with an assortment of assistant editors. Both editors believed these artists were there to propose a new project. Instead, they were informed that they were leaving Marvel and they weren't going to work for DC in the future. It was rumored the artists inquired whether DC would finance and distribute their titles. It was an offer DC declined. However, this rumor is suspect. By all accounts, it was an awkward courtesy call that somewhat confused the DC editors. When the meeting concluded, the three artists met with the Malibu partners, who Liefeld suggested fly to New York should talks with Marvel be unsuccessful. According to Dave Ulbrich, McFarlane took the lead and dictated the terms he expected from Malibu. It wasn't a discussion or a negotiation whatsoever. It was a take-it-or-leave-it proposition. Those terms being, every individual would own their creations and Malibu had no legal claim to anything there would be no editorial advice solicited or accepted from Malibu. In essence, Malibu would print, solicit, advertise, and distribute the material given to them. In return, they would receive 10% of the profit to cover operating costs. Initially, this deal would be in place for one year. The Malibu partners discussed this proposal amongst themselves and then accepted these terms. And with that, Image Comics became a reality. Will's Portacio was brought in by Jim Lee, and, with that addition, the seven original artists were in place. Unfortunately, due to a death in the family, Portacio's involvement was minimal. He does get credit as a founder, and he did attend some early talks, but he was never made an image partner. So, technically, there were only six individuals who laid the foundation for what would become Image Comics. The first official meeting of the founders took place on February 1, 1992, at Mark Silvestri's home. Also in attendance to provide marketing suggestions was Garib Seamus of Wizard Magazine. Once everyone but the founders were dismissed, the meeting began. Within this meeting, they set up the principles to guide the company, although subsequent meetings would refine these principles. And, of course, lawyers would ensure these principles were legally sound. Image Comics wasn't owned by any of the founders. It would be the brand and a separate entity. The founders would give a percentage to Image for administrative costs. The only thing Image actually owned was the trademark to the name and the logo. Image Comics only existed to present a unified collective to the market. It was a union of creators, specifically artists. For the record, the trademark to the Image Comics name was held by Rob Liefeld. 
He'd originally purchased it prior to the executioner's announcement in 1991. Thus, this new publishing venture adopted this established trademark and its name. Liefeld would transfer ownership of this trademark and the logo to the collective. The logo was designed by Hank Canals, a friend and collaborator of Liefeld's on the Young Blood title, although other sources suggest Liefeld was the designer. While a separate entity, in reality, the six founders owned shares and image. So, presumably, everyone had an equal voice in the direction and the future of the company. Otherwise, each individual creator had complete ownership and complete creative control over their properties. There was no editorial oversight from Image or from the other founders. It was total autonomy for everyone. Furthermore, a creator could leave at any time with full ownership of their properties and without any penalties. Aside from these business guidelines, it was decided that Image would be a shared superhero universe. Like Marvel and DC, all of their creations existed on the same world. The overall plan was they'd continue to do what they had always done best, superhero adventures. In the first official press release, Image Comics was known as Image Press, an imprint of Malibu Comics. Prior to this announcement, there were rumors that a number of artists at Marvel had quit and joined together in some capacity. However, until all seven stepped forward and made the announcement, it was unknown who was involved and what this meant for the industry. Of course, the seven Rebels announced were Todd McFarlane, Jim Lee, Eric Larson, Jim Valentino, Mark Silvestri, Will Sportasio, and Rob Liefeld. Also announced was former X-Men writer Chris Claremont, who was to write a title to be illustrated by Will Sportasio. He wasn't part of the collective, but he was a well-known creator, and he was the only writer asked to be included in this separation from Marvel. Shortly thereafter, Dale Keown, Larry Stroman, and Sam Keith were quietly invited to join the collective. Allegedly, this invitation was made to a fair number of artists. As an aside, both Dale Keown and Larry Stroman were the artists for titles written by Peter David, who would publicly question the motives of the Image founders. The first comic published by Image Comics, well, technically Malibu, was Young Blood No. 1, on April 16, 1992. The number of pre-orders for this comic widely differ, the lowest being 305,000 and the highest being slightly over 400,000. In the end, it was reported to have sold a total of over 1 million copies. Regardless, it debuted at number 6 on the sales charts, only being outsold by Spider-Man and the X titles. Spawn and Wildcats would also debut that year and sell well over a million copies each. All other titles would debut with a minimum of half a million in sales. Exact sales are difficult to determine due to comic books being distributed by a few different companies at the time. Moreover, those figures aren't publicly available. Reportedly, with reorders and newsstand distribution, sales for both Spawn and Wildcats were in the vicinity of 2 million copies each. Regardless of the exact numbers, the sales were impressive. All of the Image Comic titles were an unqualified success. This is where the origin of Image Comics ends, and the legend truly begins. If you enjoyed this video, please subscribe. If you would like to go a step further, click join and select the option most suitable for you. Any and all support is greatly appreciated. Thank you. That's it for today. Like, share, subscribe, and comment, and I will talk at you later. Until next time.